sides in the nation's seat of power. At one o'clock in the morning, the staff on duty gathers the day's newspapers from the presses of the country's major publications. The selected news articles, features, and opinion columns are arranged and coded. In a separate building, draft speeches, cabinet reports, national project updates, and other documents are collected. At four in the morning, the folders are sent to President Fidel Valdez Ramos at his official residence across the street from the palace compound. Not a minute is wasted at the start of the president's day. In between his regular exercises, the president goes over the papers. He writes his marginal notes on those that merit a response or immediate action. All the documents are color-coded for efficiency. Color codes are just a small detail of a whole work system that has been developed to make full, efficient use of the president's time. In fact, even the sign pen used by the president is selected for efficiency. At seven in the morning, the president arrives at the palace, continuing the business of governance for work has gone on inside the car. The car is a Malacanang office in miniature. The moment the president steps out of the vehicle, an important part of the whole day's work is already done. To this work of empowering the people, I dedicate my presidency. Today, I have returned as the president of a free people. I am profoundly conscious of the tasks that remain. Fight mass poverty and strengthen and maturize democracy. Of course, our constitution is the cornerstone of our freedom. I would rather inspire respect than impose it. Almost a hundred years ago, the first Philippine president entered Malacanang not as head of state, but as prisoner of a colonial power. <laughs> the Filipino-American war that raged for two years at the turn of the century came to an end with a capture of President Emilio Aguinaldo on March 23, 1901. From his mountain hideout in Palanan, Isabela, the first president of the Philippine Republic was forced to board the USS Vicksburg and brought to Malacanang. There he was received cordially by General Arthur MacArthur, then military governor of the newly colonized islands. Captive Filipino leader meets foreign ruler in a palace that, many years later, would become the home of Philippine presidents. But at the time, Malacanang was just the temporary residence of the American military governor. Aguinaldo was kept in seclusion under heavy guard within the palace walls. On April 1st, 1901, he had no choice but to take his oath of allegiance to the United States. It was only on April 19, after issuing a signed proclamation ending hostilities with the Americans, that Aguinaldo was allowed to leave the palace a free man. Although he never held office in Malacanang, Aguinaldo left a legacy that survives today in the palace. Aside from creating the original design of the Philippine flag, Aguinaldo was also responsible for the design of the presidential seal. Over the years, the official seal of the president has undergone changes, but it retains some of the features of Aguinaldo's original.
Malacanang Palace stands in the middle of a sprawling 10 hectares of land by the Pasig River. Surrounding the palace are some 12 buildings and a number of structures. Right beside the palace is the Kalayaan Hall, where the president's press secretary holds office. West of the palace is the premier guest house, where the office of the first lady is located. Uh, my schedule today. East of the palace is the Mbini Hall, where the executive secretary holds the fort for presidential affairs. With its floor area of 9,931 square meters, the palace itself has 70 rooms and 40 toilets and bathrooms. Malacanang is not like the White House, which was built by an American president to be the first family's home. Neither is it like England's Buckingham Palace, which was purchased by a king for the royal residence. The palace is older than the Philippine Republic. It is a landmark we inherited from a colonial past. But like many of the things in our culture, we have claimed it as our very own, improved on it, made it meaningful by giving it the imprint of our character as a people. The palace today is a result of the many renovations made by its former occupants over a period of more than a hundred years. In the late 1700s, Malacanang was a leisure villa of a Spanish gentleman named Don Luis Rocha. In 1802, Rocha sold the villa to Don José Formento, a colonel in the Spanish army. In 1825, the Spanish government took an interest in the villa and bought it from Señor Formento for 5,100 pesos, turning it into a suburb residence for the Spanish governor's general. When the place was just untamed grove, the natives considered it the dwelling place of mighty beings. They would tiptoe past the grove and whisper, May lakanjan, The phrase means, full of mighty beings, or where the noble are. In the course of time, Meilakanyan became Malakanyang. It took a catastrophe to change the course of history for the place of mighty beings. For the most part of the country's three centuries under Spanish rule, the seat of power was located within the walls of Intramuros specifically the Palacio del Gobernador, which was the official residence of the Spanish governor's general. But in 1863, a violent earthquake jolted Manila. It lasted a minute, but left a swath of destruction in its wake, and a Palacio del Gobernador in ruins. The then governor general, Rafael Echagli, was forced to move to the Malacanang Villa. He thought the villa was just going to be a temporary home. It was not to be. The transfer to the villa following the devastation was marked by a blessed event. The countess gave birth to a daughter, the first birth in the history of Malacanang. 
The birth of a child within the palace walls would be repeated 54 years later in 1917, when Governor General Francis Burton Harrison's teenage wife, Elizabeth Rentmore, gave birth to a son. And that was not to be the last fortuitous event in the palace. Many years later, in different eras, Malacanang would be the site of auspicious occasions. In 1950, just after the war, the country witnessed the first wedding in the palace. Victoria Quirino tied the knot with then Ambassador Luis Gonzalez. The daughter of widower President Elpidio Quirino, Vicky Quirino was also, at the time, the country's first lady. She was only 16 years old. During her stay in Malacanang, she gave birth to two sons, who were both baptized in the palace. In 1993, another wedding took place in Malacanang for another president's daughter. On the palace grounds, President Fidel Ramos's daughter, Josephine, exchanged vows with film actor Lloyd Sabartino. It was the first ecumenical wedding solemnized in Malacanang, and also the first wedding ceremony in the palace to be extensively covered by television. When Joe uh, decided to get married, she chose uh, Malacanang Garden to be where her wedding would be. And uh, I thought it was a very nice choice. My assignment was to take care of the flowers. I feel that Malacanang is the seat of government. And uh, being a military wife, I'm used to moving from one place to another. And uh, although so many interesting things have happened here in Malacanang, I realized that it is temporary and look forward to the next destination. At the time it was used by Governor General Echagüe, Malacanang was not what one would call a palace fit for a head of state. The lower floor of wood was close to the river and poorly elevated. There were no windows for good lighting and proper ventilation on the ground floor. Troubles besetting Spain delayed the release of funds from the Spanish crown for the reconstruction of the Palacio del Gobernador. With the rise and fall of each regime in Madrid, hopes for the reconstruction of the Palacio fluctuated. For three decades, Echague and the 17 other governors general who succeeded him were left with no choice but to use Malacanang as their official home. By the time the foundations for a new Palacio del Gobernador had finally been laid in 1899, the Americans were already in Manila to colonize the Philippines. They needed a command center, and they found it in Malacanang. The center of power in Malacanang is the president's office, located at the second floor of the palace. With his hands-on type of leadership, President Ramos also maintains an office in the nearby executive building, where he can be immediately in touch with the various departments and support staff. In the palace, state-of-the-art computerized communication systems provide immediate link-ups between the president and offices in the country and all over the world at the touch of a button. During the Marcos administration, however, the executive building was the Kalayaan Hall next to the palace. It was then called the Maharlika Hall. Of three of power and authority in this democratic The Kalayaan Hall was built during the time of Governor General Leonard Wood. A major improvement made by the Americans had to do with addressing the problem of flooding in the palace. 
In 1901, Governor General Howard Taft elevated the palace grounds by 18 inches. His wife, Helen, described Malacanang at the time in her memoirs. Malacanang is old and rather damp. In my time, some of it had not been furnished or finished according to modern ideas. But in size and dignity, it leaves nothing to be desired. The great living rooms open one into another, giving a fine perspective. And they lead through a dozen different doorways onto a whitened veranda which runs out to the bank of the Pasig River. There is a picturesque moss-covered river landing on the veranda below. The palace area was enlarged by the purchase of 17,601 square meters of land covering the area east of Malacanang. Despite Taft's measures, the flood problem in the palace persisted. When Manuel Luis Quezon took over Malacanang in 1935 as Commonwealth President, he tackled the flood problem by reclaiming 15 feet of the Pasig Riverbank and building a concrete wall at the new boundary. By this time, Malacanang had gone through many renovations under the American Governors General in the span of 35 years from the turn of the century. From a palace of wood, it was now a stone edifice. Quezon also converted the ground floor bodega of the palace into a social hall. From his study, he ordered the construction of the ground floor chapel. The location of the chapel has changed a number of times since the Quezon era. But despite its relocation at each change of administration, the chapel has remained. And the succession of the first Philippine Protestant president did not spell the end of the chapel's existence in Malacanang. A building with a rich history of over a hundred years is not without its myths and legends and stories of spooks and apparitions. It has been said that when General Dwight Eisenhower stayed in the palace as a guest, a butler came to his room one night to serve him a drink. It turned out there was no such butler in the palace and the description of the mysterious man matched that of President Quezon's butler, who had long been dead. The palace grounds also have their share of stories about enchanted spirits. In Philippine folklore, the Balete tree is known to be the dwelling place of the Capre, the one across the main entrance has its own tale of mystery about an elemental called Mr. Brown. After my husband became president, of course I took a look at the garden here, and being interested in plants, I thought we needed to add more plants, improve the garden. And uh, since there was no budget, I decided we will start with this beautiful tree, this balete tree. The trunk was empty, so what we did with a friend of mine was to add more plants in the trunk. And uh, after a week, I came back, and the tree had no leaves. And somebody said, did you ask permission from Mr. Brown? 
And I said, this Mr. Brown, oh, he's the one that lives up in the tree. So when I passed by the tree, I said, what can I lose? I said, Mr. Brown, we're just trying to improve the looks of your trunk. And a week after, I was surprised. The leaves started to grow out. And so I said, maybe there is really a Mr. Brown, only to find out that this tree really sheds its leaves. Likewise, according to some accounts, the ghost of President Carlos V. Garcia has been seen playing at his favorite chessboard at the Garcia Room of the Palace Museum. Up to now, mysterious sounds are still heard. Footfalls echoing down the hallowed hallways, inexplicable knockings on doors, the squeaking of floorboards in empty rooms, sounds that are perhaps stubborn reminders of the past that refuses to fade away, or just technological consequences of the hectic pace of the President's day. In this room is where the president goes over the many papers that need his approval. Nothing escapes the eye of President Ramos as he studies every document. For every decision is important, every stroke of the pen critical. It is the lonely job of leadership. For after all the advice and suggestions after all the discussions and deliberations, it is the president alone who makes the decisions. And so, this president is given credit for actions that have made a remarkable impact on the country, particularly the economy. Considered the sick man of Asia, the Philippines has made a phenomenal economic turnaround under President Ramos. The president makes decisions with the weight of history on his shoulders, but he makes them independently. From his desk have emanated historic landmark decisions. The peace agreement with the Muslims in Mindanao, after more than three centuries of conflict, are first in the history of the Philippines. The National Anti-Poverty Act, which generates livelihood and jobs, the opening of 65 growth centers throughout the country. The first major piece of legislation for women in 65 years, which protects all Filipinas. However, the history of independent presidential decisions is a short one. In the early part of the Republic's history, our presidents were not entirely free in deciding for the country. I, Manuel Luis Quezon, hereby solemnly swear that I will faithfully and conscientiously fulfill my duties as president of the Philippines. The Quezon presidency showed the world the governing capabilities of the Philippines. The period was a showcase of what an independent Philippines would later be in the conduct of its daily affairs. Under the Commonwealth, Quezon's landmark decisions included the women's right to suffrage, which he signed in 1932, empowering women to participate in the electoral process. Antedating the social reform agenda of President Ramos by over half a century, was Quezon's social justice program focusing on labor rights. But because the country was under the Americans at the time, quite a number of Quezon's decisions were heavily influenced by American advisors. I recognize and accept the supreme authority of the United States of America. U.S. sentiments were undoubtedly reflected in presidential policies and decrees, such as the decision to create a defense plan for the Philippines. Indeed, a decade later, the country would be drawn into the maelstrom of the Second World War, and Malacanang would be vacated.
1942. Malacanang Palace lies empty as Japanese Imperial forces invade the Philippines. Commonwealth President Manuel Quezon is forced to move the seat of government to Corregidor, known as The Rock. Corregidor also served as the headquarters of General Douglas MacArthur. May 6, 1942, Corregidor falls. Around 12,000 Filipino and American soldiers are taken prisoner. The Commonwealth President and his Vice President, Sergio Osmeña Sr., flee to the United States to establish a government in exile. The Japanese forces occupy Manila and take custody of Malacanang. October 14 of the same year, the Japanese proclaim Philippine independence. The Second Philippine Republic is born. The Japanese Imperial Army turns the palace over to Dr. Jose P. Laurel as president of the Occupation Republic. On the same day, Laurel signs the Pact of Alliance between the Philippines and Japan. All his life, my father was a passionate nationalist. And so, during his term as president of the Second Philippine Republic, he pursued a policy of national survival. We were then caught in a war not of our making, and so he felt that the objective was simply to survive the war. And he knew that national survival required the unification of the Filipino people. And so, he refused to raise an army as requested by the Japanese to fight against the Allies. On August 1st, 1944, President in exile Manuel Quezon succumbed to tuberculosis in the United States. Taking his place as president was Sergio Osmeña Sr. For the duration of the war, the country was under a dual presidency. Laurel in the Philippines under a puppet government and Osmeña in exile in the USA. Each presidency under the influence of a world power. And those were very difficult times, especially for the president. I would often find my father knelt in prayer in the chapel here in Malacanang. And uh, we had to do with what we had. The Japanese uh, occupying forces had confiscated most of our food. And so we had to observe very austere Spartan uh, regulations. In fact, we had a one-course meal, mungo and tuyo, with some vegetable, with some talbus uh, ng uh, kabote, every, uh, every day for one year. In fact, as part of the policy of survival, Papa asked everybody to plant in their backyards. And so the entire Malacanang grounds was planted uh, to vegetable, which we used uh, for our food. During Laurel's brief stay, a few improvements were made on the palace. A tea house was built at the west end of the garden. An air raid shelter was constructed at the back of the executive hall. I was about 12, going on 13 during the war. And we had bombings almost every day and we would rush to the air raid shelter during the bombings and somehow war has a special way of speeding up your maturity even during the tender age and Malacanang never really became home to to my family my mother never lived here never slept here for my father Malacanang was only the place where he had to work and fulfill his duties as president of the republic during one of the darkest years of our history. According to some accounts, President Laurel would meet secretly with Filipino guerrilla leaders at the bank of the Pasig River behind the palace. But the presidency was widely perceived as a puppet administration and Malacanang the center of Japanese imperial rule. 
I, Jose P. Laurel, President of the Republic of the Philippines, do hereby proclaim that a state of war exists between the Republic of the Philippines and the United States of America and Great Britain. The return of the Americans in 1944 sounded the death knell of the Laurel Presidency. The Japanese beat a hasty retreat as Americans returned in full force with superior firepower to liberate the country. Malacanang Palace was captured by the United States' first cavalry units. Laurel and the Japanese had by then withdrawn to Baguio and then to Japan. When the enemy was cleared from the city, General Douglas MacArthur handed the palace over to President Osmania. For a while, the palace was used as an infirmary for soldiers. When my father received the palace from the Americans, everything was in a soiled state. The devastation was everywhere. Curtains were torn, and there were many sharpener marks all around, especially damaged that portion of the palace facing the Pasig River. It was a period of tragedy and grief unparalleled in the nation's history as the people buried their dead and started the period of reconstruction. Osmeña kept the palace open to ordinary people who went to Malacanang for material help. In spite of the devastated state of the palace, no repairs were made since there were no funds for that purpose. What money, little money was collected went into the purchase of food, clothing, rice, sugar to be given out to the people who went to the palace seeking help. It was not a good time for the country, but as far as father is concerned, he was happy that he was able to do for his people what he wanted to do. Later on, Osmania found the funds to build Quonset huts for the Presidential Guard Battalion at Malacanang. Technically, Osmania was already serving beyond his term of office as president. Elections were thus held hastily. Sergio Osmania was up against Manuel Rojas. Rojas won, earning the distinction of being the president of the Philippines briefly under the Commonwealth. And then under a new republic, when the Philippines was granted independence by the United States in 1936. The people of this country have decided that they were going to establish a government of the people for the benefit of all the people. It was during the term of Rojas that the U.S. Bases Agreement was signed, giving the Americans a 99-year lease on 22 sites, including Clark Air Base and Subic Naval Base. President Rojas would also declare war on the insurgent Pukbalahap movement. But it was a brief term for Rojas, who died of a heart attack after two years in office, leaving the reins of government to his vice president, Elpidio Quirino. The body of President Rojas lay in state at the palace in what was earlier regarded as the first state funeral in Malacanang. Historians would later point to the state funeral accorded Manuel El Quezon as the first in the palace. President Quezon, who died in exile, was finally laid to rest in his beloved country in 1946, two years after his death. Other former Philippine presidents honored with a state funeral in Malacanang were El Pidio Perino in 1956 and Ramon Magsaysay in 1957. 
José Laurel was given the same honor in 1959. The Macapagal administration saw the passing away of two former presidents. In 1961, a state funeral was held in Malacanang for President Sergio Osmeña. And in 1964, Emilio Aguinaldo lay in state in the palace that held him captive 63 years earlier. The palace was once again the setting of the state funeral of Carlos P. Garcia in 1971. And when Yosnado Macapagal died in 1997, the nation paid its last respects to him in Malacanang. The ceremonial hall is where former presidents, where heads of state and heads of government are honored. When former President Diosdado Macapagal passed away, Malacanang opened its doors to pay homage to one of its former residents and to allow the government and its people to pay their respects. The Office of Presidential Protocol coordinated and in cooperation with the former president's family made the arrangements for the state funeral. It was here where the former president lay in state and where President Fidel Valdez Ramos, on behalf of the Filipino people, thanked his peer for his dedication to the welfare of the common man. When the flag is lowered to half-mast at Malacanang, the nation mourns. post-war gloom weighed down upon a nation which was still reeling from the trauma of war. When Elpidio Quirino succeeded Rojas, one of his first tasks was to preserve the memories of the past. Quirino created the government entities that would recover and preserve historical documents and artifacts. The perspective of time has been a great judge of my father's presidency. Today, we see how Quirino was a man ahead of his time. His visions for our country were the blueprints of what present government still uses as their basis for our policy. The same dedication to preserve the past for the future is pursued by President Fidel Ramos. Under his administration, the palace is not only the office of the president, but also the place where the country's historical memories of past presidencies reside. Now this is the dining room, which is in honor of the first president of the Philippines. Part of Malacanang has been transformed into a museum showcasing memorabilia of past presidents, with each president assigned a particular room. many fond memories as well as difficult ones of the palace. It's not everyone that wakes up one day being a normal teenager and suddenly you have to be not only first daughter but first lady and doing the duties of someone much older. But in this I must say my father was a great help 
because he would talk to me and help keep me abreast of what was happening in the country so that I would not be embarrassed if I had to ask, answer any questions that were asked of me. And then, of course, without having a mother, it was difficult to know how to dress. But there again, uh, I just sort of felt my way through. And then, on the personal side, also, it was difficult. Can you imagine having <laughs> people come to court you and have to face the president of the Philippines? It's not easy even facing an ordinary father, what more facing the president of the Philippines. During President Quirino's term, the music room was remodeled. Oil paintings of former presidents were hung in the reception room. And as if to dispel the pervading gloom of the country that permeated the palace, damask drapes and thick carpets were added to bring back the grandeur of Malacanang's Spanish time regal atmosphere. As a way of making Malacanang reach out to the people, Quirino started a weekly radio show, which was dubbed Fireside Chats, featuring the administration's programs and accomplishments and make up for time lost by accelerating our productive efforts. Many years later, in the era of television, the power of broadcast media would be maximized by President Ferdinand E. Marcos. Under Marcos, a TV studio was built at the Calayaan Hall, equipped with terrestrial microwave facilities for the telecast of live announcements by the president. When Corazon Aquino took office, she used the same studio for her weekly radio show, Magdanon Sa Pamulo, television interviews, and live broadcast messages. In the 90s, the idea of Quirino's fireside chat as a way of forging a partnership with media has seen a more meaningful revival. President Ramos has established a stronger link with a broadcast audience through a weekly radio and TV program featuring his various activities. In fact, the president's regular use of satellite feeds, fiber optic technology, computers, the internet, the teleconferencing has brought Malacanang firmly into the age of global information. The first time Alacanang opened its doors to the public as an official act of reaching out to the people was during the time of President Ramon Magsaysay. Malacanang's open door policy was characteristic of his image and style of leadership as a champion of a common man. Social justice should not only be a thought, it should be something tangible that the poor man starving will feel, will touch. Magsaysay kept the palace open despite complaints that the flood of visitors took a toll on the furniture and rugs and the family's privacy. Every day there are thousands of people wants to see the palace and uh, after so many weeks when we realized that uh, it's too much for the for the building uh, it uh, he decided that it will be two or three times only a week that the people can come because the people bring their food they stay the whole day and uh, well it's a mess <laughs> 
Magsaysay was the first Philippine president to use the Barong Tagalog during his inauguration and in official functions. Part of the Magsaysay legend are accounts of the president toasting dignitaries with native drinks. I remember when he is serving a cocktail with the foreign countries uh, or foreign people, he decided that he has to offer a local wine. Lambanog ata yung po ano, hindi yung mga cocktail, yung mga red wine, white wine, hindi yun. The drapery should be locally made. The barong should be worn on uh, official functions. And the drinks should be locally made in the Philippines. Magsaysay toasted his guests with salabat or ginger tea and served them local dishes such as pinakbet and dinimding. The palace was crowded with people every day so that Magsaysay had to hold office at times in the presidential yacht. But at the end of each day, he made it a point to come home to the palace. I was requesting to to change the curtain because it's uh, since time of uh, President Quezon uh, yet. He said it's uh, quite expensive. And when he found out that I got sick and I was brought to the hospital in John Hopkins to be operated on my sinus, and that's only the time that he decided that he had to change all the curtain, provided it is made in the Philippines. <laughs> The members of the Fourth Estate were regular palace visitors during Magsaysay's incumbency. This is Malacanang's Heroes Hall, and this is where President Ramos holds his regular weekly press conferences. I think the last time that he had a press conference here was before he left for abroad. In our time, during the years of Magsaysay, this is not where we used to meet the president, which were not really regular press conferences. We held our meetings with the president upstairs in the open balcony upstairs where we enjoyed the breeze of the Pasig River. And as I said, they were not really regular press conferences. We, they were actually informal meetings. To uh, meet with him. Each Philippine president has had his own unique style in dealing with a powerful press. Things change, not only here in the palace, but also in relations with the mass media. Carlos P. Garcia, was a very likable president, but uh, he hardly met the press in his time. Garcia was followed by Jos Dado Macapagal, and uh, he too held irregular press conferences. Marcos had a different style. He met the press quite regularly because he had a lot of things to say. Cory Aquino hardly met the press. President Ramos is accessible. Today, Malacanang's relationship with the press has the imprint of President Ramos's personal touch. It is common knowledge that the president takes the initiative to communicate personally with journalists through his marginal notes on their columns. The fact that the president has a press secretary underscores the importance of the chief executive's relationship with media. Press relations with the office of the president date back to the Commonwealth period. Although Manuel Quezon did not have a press secretary, he had a staff of men who handled liaison with the press. It was President Osmeña who first introduced the idea of a presidential spokesman to deal with the media. But it was President Magsaysay who elevated the post of press secretary to cabinet rank.
The idea of Malacanang as the palace of the common man ended with a death in a plane crash of the popular Magsaysay. Succeeding him, President Carlos V. Garcia discontinued the practice of keeping the palace doors open to the man on the street. For President Garcia, the focus was on Philippine economic independence. He espoused the Filipino first policy, giving priority to Filipino products and Filipino entrepreneurs and industrialists, setting the stage for import substitution and the flourishing of Philippine industries. As for the palace, it was back to the old image of Malacanang as the inaccessible seat of power. Malacanang as Palace of the Common Man was partially revived during President Diosdado Macapagal's term. Once a week, the palace was open to ordinary folk who needed to see the president. During our time, Malacanang was both a home and an office, and the people were welcome. He opened Malacanang in the way that on Fridays, he had a common man's day where thousands of people could come in with whatever complaints they had, or just to shake his hand, or just to say hello, or just to thank him for helping them improve their lives. And that has always been his norm of conduct for the four years that he was president. Elected on the campaign program, President of the Masses, Mahapagal invited labor leaders, artists, and media men to the palace. When we came into Malacanang for the first day from the inauguration, I found that the palace was not neat enough, was not clean enough for my taste. So what I did was give instructions to the staff who were already here on how I wanted the palace cleaned and neat. There was no renovation in the sense that there was no physical tearing down of walls. The renovation was fixing leaking roofs, rearranging furniture, some curtains, and uh, other things that the children would need, which we got from other rooms to transfer to the family quarters. President Macapagal changed Independence Day from July 4 to June 12, in honor of the Kawit Proclamation of Independence in 1898. From an inward-looking nation during Garcia's time, the Philippines became outward-looking under the Macapagal administration. Macapagal made innovative moves in the area of foreign policy, initiating the formation of the Malaysia-Philippine-Indonesia bloc, or Mafilindo, the predecessor of the ASEAN. During his time, Macapagal also Filipinized the names of government agencies and enforced the use of the Filipino language in the armed forces of the Philippines, keeping alive the fervor of nationalism. I train team na sumusumpa. Nandito pa rin ko. Oh, 
nationalism intensified in the late 60s. Suddenly there were questions to be answered, gaps to be bridged, as the youth discovered their power and raised their fists in protest against the established order. Nationalism intensified further in the early 70s, this time backed by ideology. In the very early 60s, the UP students came to demonstrate in Malacanang. However, they were able to enter the grounds of Malacanang, although they were demonstrating against the committee against anti-Filipino activities. Naturally, the UP community and the UP students felt that this committee work was an infringement against academic rights and the freedom of students for free thought. They came, entered the grounds in Malacanang, and expressed their dissent and their discontent with this particular kind of investigation. By the late 60s and early 70s, the temperament had changed. The students that came to demonstrate in front of Malacanang believed in an ideology. They identified themselves with the forces of the proletariat. They felt that the representatives of the state and the government were on the other side, were part and parcel of imperialism. So they came to demonstrate, but the gates were closed. They were the outsiders, and those behind the gates were the insiders. It was a clash of forces that would ring throughout history and give meaning to the decade of the 70s. On January 28, 1970, youth activists stormed Malacanang. It was a period that came to be known as the first quarter storm. It was a time of instability, with sporadic violence breaking out in the streets. President Ferdinand Marcos declared martial law. As of the 21st of uh, this month, I signed Proclamation Number 1081, placing the entire Philippines under martial law. Despite the turmoil and uncertainty outside the palace walls, it was business as usual for the affairs of state in Malacanang. The pride, prestige, and power of the presidency were manifested in lavish dinners for foreign guests. This was in sharp contrast with the state banquets held in the same place under past administrations. It was for the state dinner for then Prince, Crown Prince Akihito and Princess Michiko, now the Emperor and the Empress of Japan. We found out that we had nothing, nothing at all in Malacanang. At that time, you had to serve in soup bowls, for example, rice container. The first course had to be a tray. If there was any, it was not complete. If you want to, uh, for example, serve a dinner for 150, it had to be a mixture of many things. So it was not elegant. So we had to bother our friends for nice things to be brought to the palace to be used for the state dinner. Since then, things have improved. President Ramos himself took a direct hand in reorganizing the presidential pantry with a fully equipped steward room, another first for Malacanang.
had no intention of running for a third term. Don't you think that two terms is enough? In power at Malacanang for two decades, Marcos made a strong impact on grassroots politics by establishing local government at the barangay level. And despite the prevailing Cold War, he paved the way for bilateral relations with socialist and communist countries. Likewise, under the Marcos era, cultural edifices were built, encouraging the growth and development of culture and the arts. For 20 years under the Marcos administration, Malacanang underwent a series of renovations. It's also very different from what it used to be when we were living here. Although I remember the, uh, I remember the furniture, I remember the desks, although they weren't here. Uh, they were serving some different, even the books, I remember. I remember this is the place that I grew up, and it wasn't a very normal place for a kid to grow up in, but it was home. When we first moved in here, I was seven years old, and uh, it was 20 years uh, that we stayed here. It didn't feel like 20 years. It went by so quickly. But in that 20 years, we saw many changes in the palace. They, there was a minor innovation just to pretty the place up and to make it more functional. And then later on, there was a very major renovation where we expanded the palace to give more, more space, not for the family, but also for the offices that were being moved into the palace. A mosque was built on the grounds for the convenience of a state visitor. In 1979, the original Nara panels were torn down. In their place were installed simulated Sawali material. The transparent panes of a skylight roof were replaced with ornate fiberglass designs. The brightly lit veranda, called the Heroes Hall, was turned into a stateroom sealed off by tinted bulletproof glass. When we first came to the palace, it felt very much like an old traditional colonial home. But as time went on, and more functions were moved into the palace, it became more and more of an office and a working place, which really should not have been surprising, because although we thought of it as home, the palace was, after all, the seat of government and the seat of power of our country. Evolving from a country home in the 1800s to a president's home a century later, Malacanang Palace had become, under martial law, a virtual fortress. In one of the rooms in the palace, Marcos and his men strategized the military rule of the country. Fully armed soldiers guarded not only the palace gates, but the roads leading to Maracanyan. The Presidential Security Command was formed. Whereas its predecessor, the Presidential Guard Battalion, was simply a unit under the armed forces, the Presidential Security Command was a composite military group reporting directly to the office of the President. The beginning of the end for Marcos came in 1983 in the figure of a dead man on the tarmac of the Manila International Airport. Marcos's arch rival, Senator Benigno Ninoy Aquino, returned home from exile on August 21st and was felled by an assassin's bullet while in the custody of military escorts. The tragedy seared the nation's conscience and exposed the cracks in the Marcos monolith. February 1986, a faction of the military led by then-General Fidel Ramos 
and Defense Minister Juan Ponce Enrile broke away from the Marcos regime. The breakaway triggered a civilian-backed uprising that came to be known as the EDSA Revolution. A room in Malacatian was instantly converted into a war room by Marcos and his men. The president and his loyal officers mapped out their moves to quell the uprising. In four days, however, the People Power Revolution brought the 20-year presidency to an end. Marcos and his family fled to Hawaii. The people stormed Malacanang's gates and overran the palace. At last, the virtual fortress yielded its many secrets the lifestyle of its former occupants. And the pieces of evidence pointing to a seriously ailing president. had reclaimed Malacanian. The weeks following the victory of people power, the guard houses on the streets leading to the palace were dismantled. Vendors and hawkers populated the sidewalks outside Malacanang. Crowds poured into the palace grounds. Corazon Aquino, widow of the martyred senator, was installed as president of the provisional government. And consecrate myself to the service of the nation. To the service of the nation. So help me God. So help me God. Well, I still remember when I first came to Malacanang as a private citizen. This was under the Macapagal administration. You know, I was governor at that time, so was, I was invited to one of the dinners here. Of course, I was in awe of Malacanang. It, it really is an awesome place. And then I never dreamed at the time that I would return one day to be president and actually live here and have my office here in Malacanang. One of President Aquino's first acts was to turn the palace into a museum showcasing the personal effects the Marcos family had left behind. President Aquino shunned the palace and held office at the guest house. Good morning. Do you want now a tour of the place? Uh, yeah. All right, please. Looks, um, so you, let's start with this one. I am now the house. I chose the guest house to hold office in. First, because of security. And secondly, it was some kind of symbol. I guess it was important for me to remember that I was just a guest here in Malacanang. This was not going to be my home and office forever. So that symbolism was kept very clear in my mind that I was only here for that term of six years. President Aquino also became the first president to voluntarily make her home outside Malacanang's walls. I chose not to live in Malacanang. First, it was a campaign pledge. I believed that we Filipinos belonging to a developing country, it was not right for the leader of the country to live amidst luxury while the rest of the Filipino people were suffering because of poverty. Besides, there was also a plus in not living here. You know, at the end of a long day, I could leave and go to another place, to Arlegi, 
sort of pretending that I left the worries and the cares behind and going to another venue to be, shall I say, re-energized or at least working again in completely different surroundings. Tight security had to be thrown around the palace once again, following the series of coup attempts that threatened to unseat President Aquino. But, despite six years of instability brought about by seven coup attempts, the Aquino administration succeeded in maintaining democratic space. President Aquino also signed into law a revolutionary piece of legislation that devolved power from the national government to the local governments. At the end of her term, Corazon Aquino peacefully turned over the reins of government to the new president. With peace firmly restored under the new president, it was now possible to fully return the palace to the people. Malacanang today remains a powerful symbol of the closeness of the presidency to the people. The palace is not an awesome edifice that stands out in the urban landscape. No vast spaces separate Malacanang from the rest of the city. Instead, it is tucked away in a crowded part of the metropolis with residential neighbors only a stone's throw away. No wide thoroughfares lead to the palace, only narrow streets open to the flow of pedestrian and vehicular traffic. The streets outside the palace grounds have been this way since the birth of the modern republic in 1946. Malacanang, the palace, remains in the middle of the old crowded city, close to the people. Today, the idea of the people's palace is made real even to those in the far-flung barrios. President Fidel Ramos not only opens the doors of Malacanang to the people, he also brings the palace to the people by holding cabinet meetings in the provinces. Malacanang's concerns go with him, whether he's working in the presidential car, aboard the presidential chopper, airborne on the presidential plane, a sea on the presidential yacht, on every state visit abroad. His regular visits to the countryside expand the concept of the presidency, bringing it beyond the palace walls. President Ramos has transformed Malacanang from a place to a concept, the great concept of shared power. Malacanang is where the president is.